moms would have smaller families. It's like, look, if you want to die alone with your cats and your expensive MacBook, just say so. We're in pretty good times now. Longer lifespan, less our mannerisms, our posture, the way we carry ourselves, how we walk. These are all communication tools. These women may sound like any lifestyle influencer, but they have another agenda, right-wing politics is a concerted effort in our culture to accuse feminine beauty of being a social construct. We have upended natural gender roles by mandating that all Westerners deny even the existence of biological gender. Which of in this episode, we hear about new research into the growing cohort of women influencers peddling anti-feminist ideology on social media and how they're changing the face of the far right. I'm Gemma Ware and you're listening to The Conversation Weekly, The World Explained by Experts. So I'm joined for this episode by Avery Annapol, one of the politics editors at The Conversation in London. Hello, Avery. Hi, Gemma. So Avery, you're based in the UK, but you are originally from the United States. And I know that it's some conversations that you've been having with friends back home that got you interested in the story we're talking about in this episode. So tell me about that. Yeah, so during uh, the early days of the pandemic, I remember seeing a lot of chatter on social media, um, hearing about stories of friends of friends, seeing women online who I previously thought of as feminists, very progressive or left wing, starting to share a lot of misinformation about vaccines. Uh, some of these really kind of delving into the conspiracy theories. Lots of people talk about what's called the wellness to QAnon pipeline, which looks at how quickly some people seem to move from the sort of hippie, holistic subculture to pretty extreme conspiracy theories in far right politics. So these women are mainly American. How did they fit into the right wing political scene in America? Yeah, I think a lot of this really does tie into women's roles in politics, especially during the Trump years. Uh, we've seen women and mothers play a really outsized role in changing political culture. So things like the parents rights group Moms for Liberty, um, who are driving changes in education, which amount to book bans in many states and sort of far right ideology. Women have also played a key organizing role in the January 6th attack at the Capitol building. Um, and in recent years, we've just seen a lot of very young tech savvy women in conservative media and politics generally. And I think all of this is sort of happening alongside changes on social media in how motherhood and femininity is portrayed by influencers. So mommy bloggers becoming homesteaders, homesteaders becoming trad wives. Trad wife? What's a trad wife? Trad wife stands for traditional wives. So these are women who have very traditional views on gender, a lot of it drawing from religious fundamentalism, following the idea that a woman's role is to be a wife and a mother and to be subservient to her husband. And so there's a lot of nostalgia for periods like 1950s America. And we see a lot of overlap between trad wives and far right politics. So obviously not all conservative women are on the far right. So what are the kinds of political views that these influencers are putting forward on their social media channels? Of course. Well, like any political view, there is a spectrum of what people believe. Um, but when we talk about the far right in the US and Europe, uh, some themes that emerge are a really strong sense of nationalism, often white nationalism, anti-Semitism, um, and opposition to immigration, ethnic diversity, LGBTQ rights, and of course, very traditional views on gender, which is why we talk about trad wives. Okay, so you wanted to find out more about this nexus between far right politics and the women who are talking about it on, on social media and making a brand of themselves for doing so. And you then found a researcher who was really studying that. And her name is Evian Leidig. Tell us about her. So Evian is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Culture Studies at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And she also is a research fellow for the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague. And she recently published a book called The Women of the Far Right, Social Media Influencers and Online Radicalization. Okay, great. Well, her research sounds fascinating. And it was you who actually went and spoke to Evian for this episode. So where did you start? So I started by asking her to dispel a misconception about women and gender and the far right. I think like a lot of people... When we talk about the far right, what comes to mind for me is the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. So images of young, white, very angry men carrying torches. So I asked Evian, what do people get wrong when we think about women and the far right? 
I think you've touched on what is, yes, very much a mainstream representation or perhaps portrayal of women's political activism, which is predominantly left-wing activism. And of course, that's influenced by the legacy of the women's rights movement, the feminist movement, etc. But she says there's also a long history of women's involvement in conservative political activism. Some good examples of that is after the Reconstruction period in the U.S. South, where there was a lot of war monuments that were being constructed and put up in public spaces. A lot of the organizing and the fundraising for that was done by conservative women, women who wanted to preserve Southern cultural heritage as as they saw it. And similarly with the case during the civil rights movement in the period immediately after where we saw a number of women come to the forefront, particularly in the domains of education, where they very much felt like they had to, quote, preserve Southern culture and Southern heritage as they framed it. So a figure I think about is Phyllis Schlafly, who organized against the Equal Rights Amendment, claiming that it was, quote, unnatural to women's designed roles within society. The Equal Rights Amendment was a proposed amendment to the U.S. Constitution designed to guarantee equal legal rights for all American citizens, regardless of sex. Phyllis Schlafly, an American conservative political activist and author, led the conservative women's movement that opposed the amendment in the 1970s. The amendment ultimately did not become part of the U.S. Constitution. So there have been some public figures here and there, but by and large, perhaps not as visible in the public space. When it comes to the visibility of women in far-right political movements, Evian says that historically, women have been overshadowed by male leaders. When people think about the far right, they have this stereotype of maybe this young male skinhead or, or something like that. I think that is changing a little bit as we see more female politicians, for example, across Europe and North America who have become much more outspoken in terms of representing the ideology and also the politics. And as I argue in my research for the book, a lot of that comes down to women play quite a significant role in terms of legitimizing and normalizing a lot of far-right ideology in order to make it seem acceptable or to have that mainstream appeal. In the 21st century, some far-right political parties and movements have had women serving in leadership positions. This includes Marine Le Pen in France, Alice Fidel in Germany, and Anne Coulter in the U.S. But for her book, which was published in 2023, Evian was particularly interested in women far-right social media influencers, specifically in North America and Europe, who use the internet to recruit and radicalize their followers. So these are women usually of millennial and some Gen Z age who are very active on social media. And the messaging is rather consistent with the history of, of conservative thinking in terms of notions about traditional gender roles for women and for men, which related to that means a sort of a non-recognition or non-tolerance for people who fall outside those constructions of femininity and masculinities. These women are vehemently anti-LGBTQ and vehemently uh, anti-non-binary identities as well. They very much consider themselves anti-feminist. They say that you should embrace your God-given femininity. I say that in quotes. And they believe that feminism has forced the breakdown of gender roles within society and is the cause for a plethora of various social ills. I'm going to start out by saying I blame feminism. I blame feminism for the reaction to what's going on and for the perpetuation of what's going on and why this migration, this mass migration into Europe has gotten so bad. When Evian was conducting her research, watching hundreds of hours of YouTube videos and scrolling social media posts, she noticed something interesting about these influencers and what they had in common. So these women all have really similar backgrounds in terms of growing up in middle-class families and in middle-class neighborhoods. They describe going to university and after that, many of them living in urban areas and trying to climb the professional corporate ladder. They also describe having friends and colleagues that they socialize with. So things that seem quite normal and quite healthy. But then there's a particular moment in time in which all of these far-right women influencers 
say that they felt deeply unhappy and depressed with their life situation. And here they attribute feminism for that unhappiness. They say that feminism forces women into the workplace, that it forces them to perform tasks that are, quote, unnatural to them. But, she says, a lot of the women who now identify as anti-feminists claim to have previously considered themselves feminists, either in their 20s or while they were students at university. And so they sometimes will call themselves recovering feminists because they've been reawakened to far-right ideology and this notion that feminism is a, a left-wing indoctrination principle that is being pushed in schools and within mainstream society. These women very much are anti-feminist in, in how they identify. And yet, in some ways, they also have relied upon the advances of feminism to actually be successful as influencers. For example, they own bank accounts where they collect donations from, from their followers or from sponsors and advertising revenue. Some of these influencers write publications. It could be books. It could be columns in magazines. They've also attended university, many of them. So I think it's quite ironic that they discuss the failures of feminism, and yet they very much have benefited from feminist progressive movements and then the outcomes that have been achieved for women. So you mentioned that you watched a lot of their videos on YouTube and that they're influencers on social media. How similar are they to your average you know, fashion or beauty influencer that someone just scrolling on Instagram might come across? And how would you know that this is far right or, or radicalized content? I think for the average person, if you're interested in, say, food blogging, you're unlikely to come across these women if you're searching for food content on Instagram. I mean, these women are not the top food bloggers, for example. Rather, my argument is they use certain genres like food blogging or perhaps health and wellness products and, and lifestyle as a way of both normalizing their far-right views and or it's a strategy of retention in terms of once they might radicalize or recruit a follower through their political commentary, it's then a way of actually showcasing how they live their lifestyle through everyday Instagram posts. So the way I like to think about it is that they are merging both their political ideology and their personal brands into one. These women are really adept at showcasing a more holistic brand of themselves. But once someone starts following or watching these far-right influencers, it's not always easy to distinguish their political content from other, more generic lifestyle content. These women are really good at using coded language and being very subtle at times about their beliefs. At other times, it becomes very explicit. For example, a lot of the content during the pandemic was sharing a lot of information that was anti-vax, anti-mask, anti-lockdown rhetoric, sometimes very much sharing disinformation about the, the vaccine and about COVID more specifically. But other times it can be a bit more explicit. For example, I was watching this YouTube live stream and the focus of that YouTube channel is about motherhood content. So it's things like sharing parenting tips or how to conceive or how to breastfeed, topics that are rather mundane. I distinctly remember how during one live stream, one of them started talking about the importance of reproduction to save the white race. She's referring to a conversation between three female influencers discussing their birth stories. They jokingly reference a meme about the importance of having more children to preserve the white race. It's, it's an awesome thing. That was my next question. Are you gonna Are you gonna have more children? <laughs> you know, there's like the meme, like you gotta have ten kids, right? Like, uh, yeah, you hey. single handedly need to perpetuate the white race. Don't you know? It's like <laughs> Evian says these influencers are skilled at finding the right mix between being direct and being subtle. They're also adept at using coded language that their followers can relate to, which allows them to quickly recognize and connect with others who share similar beliefs. They might also manipulate their content descriptions to evade internet filters, meaning their content can at times slip into more generic social media feeds and avoid being moderated. There was um, one Instagram story where an influencer had written the word vaccination, but she had manipulated the text using the at symbol or using 
different characters and numbers. And similarly, she was using the letter V and then the X emoji following that to signify vaccine. And that was because during the time, Instagram had introduced this feature where any posts containing the words COVID or vaccine automatically got a banner pop-up at the bottom of posts that would direct users to the World Health Organization's page about the pandemic. And so these influencers knew that. They were very adept at finding ways to circumvent the regulation of their content. I asked Evian who follows the women she studies, other than researchers like herself. When it comes at least to attempting to recruit women into the far right, these influencers say that they're targeting two different types of women. The first are tradcast, traditional Catholics, who are women who've already perhaps been raised in traditional religious upbringings and so are already a bit more attuned to their messaging and already believe in, say, aspects of traditionalism and family moral values. The second type of woman is one that we touched upon a bit earlier, which is the recovering feminist. So these are women in their late 20s, early 30s, who might feel like feminism has failed them in some way and who might be inclined to join what is this sisterhood that these far-right women promise and saying you'll be much happier if you take up traditional roles rather than trying to force yourself into public work, for example. But Evian found that their followers don't just include other women. I actually found really interestingly that at least on YouTube, it seems like they were recruiting or gaining the attention of male followers much more. Indeed, one of them had said that she looked at her YouTube analytics and 85% of her viewers were male, which I found pretty astonishing as uh, such a high number. And indeed, they do create content geared around narratives of masculinity. For the, for example, they talk about hypermasculinity, about how mainstream society that is, quote, feminist controlled forces men to act in ways contrary to their, quote, biologically ordained traits of aggression and dominance. And so their message to young men is that if you join the far right, you can exercise those traits and take the lead within the movement and, you know, ideally find a submissive traditional wife. So there is a dual messaging that they use at play here when it comes to different types of gender narratives that they'll employ towards both their male and female followers in this space. In one of her research interviews, Evian spoke to a man who had previously been radicalized watching far-right content on YouTube. At the time of the interview, he was just beginning his de-radicalization journey. She asked him where he saw the role of women in the far-right movement. He said to me, a movement without women is doomed to fail. And that really stuck with me in terms of Yes, of course, the far right needs to have women within its cause to help champion its ideology. Otherwise, it's going to fall apart. And and perhaps that's more of a strategy of legitimacy that they're employing. And I think very much the message that these women sell, which is, again, a lot more subtle than their male counterparts. I think that provides that sense of mainstreaming and normalization as a, as a tactic to, to very much sell far-right ideology and to be able to model that lifestyle for their audiences. These women also take on important roles in crowdfunding or providing a palatable public face to movements that traditionally center men. So for example, one of these influencers I studied, her husband has been banned off of every main platform <laughs> imaginable, but she's remained on all of them. And what's ironic is that she believes in the same ideas, but she's able to frame her message in ways that are a bit softer. She's not as confrontational as he is. She's not as aggressive as he is. She uses a lot more coded language. And I think because of that, she's been able to sustain her online presence and still have a very big audience. I think it also shows a lot about how successful these women can be compared to their male counterparts. Something Evian told me surprised me about how relatable this content is, both to a general audience and even someone like Evian, who's very aware of what's going on. I think there was many moments when I could feel like I related to these women. And the fact that, yes, I think these are women that I could have gone to school with when I was a child, right? I mean, in terms of where they grew up and the neighborhoods that they grew up and 
I saw many similarities in terms of our backgrounds and also life events as well, because as I was writing about these women over the last few years, they were going through different stages of life events and, and I was as, as well. So, I mean, I even remember looking at some of these forums of red pill women, which is this Reddit forum for women who have been quote red pilled or radicalized. And even some of the women in there said, oh, I have a PhD and I feel so lost now. And uh, maybe I made the wrong decision with my career choice. And that sort of hit me in the sense of, okay, like this is somebody who is quite similar in background to I am, at least in education. So I, I very much can see how an individual could be drawn into this world because it's not, oh, I'm radicalized. It's, I felt lost. I felt isolated. I was searching for the truth. Or I was searching for something that would help explain why I was feeling this way. I mean, these influencers oftentimes use the discourse of self-help as in like just trying to find self-confidence or just trying to find your most authentic self. And when you frame your radicalization through that type of narrative, it's very appealing and it can be quite attractive, I think, to someone who feels quite vulnerable in their life stage. Avery, thank you so much. That was a really unique insight into this world of far-right influencers. How politically important are these women influencers in American politics today? So if these women are influencers, by definition, they're trying to influence their sometimes hundreds of thousands of followers. Many people might trust them more than they trust traditional media to bring them news and information. But it won't reach everyone. You know, even Evian says that as a white cisgender woman, she's more likely than other people to find these influencers relatable. But in general, if they're making extreme ideas more palatable or relatable to the mainstream, I think that's something that should concern anyone who cares about the spread of misinformation, the health of American democracy, and just the progress that's been made for women around the world generally. And we should say this isn't a uniquely American trend either, is it? No, it's not. So Evian's research looks mostly at influencers from North America, Europe, and Australia. But you can see examples of this in other parts of the world. In Evian's other research, she discusses how female influencers in India and Brazil are using their platforms to uphold far-right ideas. In those cases, they're about nationalism, class, religion, race, gender, and caste. Thank you so much, Avery, for bringing us this episode. It's been great to have you on. Thank you for having me. That's it for this episode. Thank you to Evian Leidig for talking to us about her research and to Avery Annapol who interviewed her. This episode of The Conversation Weekly was produced and written by Mend Marawani. Sound design was by Eloise Stevens and our theme music is by Nisa Saar. Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor. Alice Mason runs our social media and Soraya Nandi does our transcripts. I'm Gemma Ware, the show's executive producer. You can connect with us on Instagram at theconversation.com, on X, formerly known as Twitter, at TC underscore audio, or email us directly at podcast at theconversation.com. If you like what we do, please do support our podcast and The Conversation more broadly by going to donate.theconversation.com. That's donate.theconversation.com. And please also do give us a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts, especially on Spotify, where you can answer a Q&A about the show. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you.